and they take people on cruises into international waters, so beyond any national boundaries or conflicts. And there, in those international waters, she and others give talks to the passengers about peace. It was really inspiring for me to meet Tanaka-san, and she was so opening, open and welcoming to me. After our tea, she took us for okonomiyaki, which is a specialty of the Hiroshima area. It's a kind of um, pancake with vegetables and meat. It was really good. And that's um, uni in the bottom right. And out of this lovely informal meeting, Yumi wrote a little article for her newspaper. Some of you might have seen it already, but if you look on my blog, there's a link, both in Japanese and in English. In Nagasaki, where we actually went first, we, we, um, we spent a little bit more time in Nagasaki. This image shows the church, which was 500 meters from the epicenter when the bomb fell. So it was mostly destroyed. And the image is of a memorial service. In 1950 something, the church was rebuilt on the same spot. They took a piece of the original church and put it near ground zero. A good friend of Noriko's arranged for us to have a tour at the Atomic Blood Column Disease Institute. And their work is to record and share with the world, for the health of all, what happened to the atomic bomb survivors. So they, they track. They also are involved with some um, work at Fukushima, educating the public about when it's safe to go back. And I find that just so inspiring that they're doing that, because, because there's so much fear around radiation, and they're able to step in and say, yes, it's safe to go back to your village now. They have a little museum. They're located within Nagasaki University, which was very near the epicenter. So the university was very much affected by the bomb. This is a clock that was stopped at 11.02, the time that the bomb fell. This is a lab coat of someone who was there when the bomb fell. And that's the blood on the lab coat. Noriko's friend, Makoto-san, is showing us a, pl a plaque of all the names of the people who died at Nagasaki University. And then he took us up a little hill to the shrine where they had gathered all the bones that were on the university ground. And they don't know, they had no way of identifying them, but they gathered them all and they buried them on the hill and then they built a shrine. So we cleaned the shrine and we did some prayers there. And I felt very grateful to have been taken to that spot. It was very moving to be there. We visited the home, the final home of Takashi Nagai. Has anyone heard of him? He wrote The Bells of Nagasaki. He was a doctor at Nagasaki University at the hospital there. So when the bomb fell, he and his team were hit. And those that could get up, got up and went to help those that were even worse off. Eventually, he succumbed to cancer and he was living in this little hut with his two kids. He's an inspiration. He, he wrote books and poetry. And he was a devout Christian. He's one of the people that exemplifies the spirit of Japan and the healing spirit of Japan and the dedication to peace, not revenge. This is the actual ground zero. And for both Noriko and I, it was very intense to be here. She's actually been three times now. 
we went into the museum and we looked at the artifacts. I would say emotionally that might have been the most difficult time for me in the in the in the whole visit was going through the was going through the Nagasaki Museum. This is another clock stopped at 1102. They they had exhibits. This one shows atomic bomb tests around the world. So we've been walking on our own and Stephen as well, and then Noriko and I sat down to compare notes. And me from the West and her from Japan, it was quite a moving conversation because we were both impacted by walking through, but we each have a different perspective. And Noriko shared with me that her mom was working in a military factory when she was young, and that when Noriko was a little girl in second or third grade, they gathered all the students in the gymnasium and they showed them images of the atomic bombing that were even more gruesome than what are in the museum and how that had traumatized her to have to look at those images. And that she wouldn't let go of her mom's hand for a long time after that. So Noriko, I think you joined me on the Neutron Trail more completely than you ever expected would happen. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really grateful that we went together. <laughs> the Peace Park outside of the museum has a completely different energy to it. The air is full of prayers. It, it has a very peaceful, warm feeling. And even though it was November, it was a, quite a nice warm day out. There's lots of statues donated um, by all different countries to Peace. This is one of my favorites, and it was actually done by a Japanese artist. The baby that looks like it's dying is Japan when it was hit by the bomb. And the woman represents all the countries of the world, you can see those flowers on her skirt, who came to Japan's aid. Noriko noticed this man talking animatedly to a group of Japanese people, and she went over to see what it was about. Then she came back to me and she said, Olivia, he's an atomic bomb survivor. Come over here. <laughs> so she took me over, and, and we met him. Hayazaki-san. He's 83, and um, I wanted to take his picture, and at the moment that I clicked, he put up the peace sign. I didn't even know he was going to do it. He was such a skilled storyteller, and so skilled at connecting with people. And he's just out there. He's not online anywhere that I can find. He's out there in the park talking to people about peace. And his story, you can see it in the corner there on the right, is that when he was 16, he was working at, um, wait, the math's not quite right, but however old he was 70 years ago, um, 13. Yeah, eight, yeah, 13. <laughs> he was working in a factory, and his boss told him to go to the other building. And then the bomb fell, and 30 people were killed, including his boss, and he and one other worker survived. So if his boss hadn't told him to go in the other building, he wouldn't be alive to be in the park to tell everyone about peace. So I asked Noriko, please could you tell him about my grandfather? And Noriko was kind of hesitant, and I was really sure, so I, I just felt in my heart that it was important for him to know. 
it wasn't like I needed anything other than I just wanted him to know. I wanted to make that connection with him. So Noriko did tell him, and he didn't say anything, but he put his arm around me and he took my hand and I just felt so much love. And there we are, both looking towards the future, just like in the end of the constellation. And his message to me, through his energy, his body language, was that we have to accept what happened, all of it, in order to move on. And he asked us to um, pour water on this rock there, which we did. That concludes the neutron trail part of the trip. And the, this last part is some images of, of temples and shrines. Again, I think without that, the trip wouldn't have been what it was. It wouldn't have had the magic that it had. And it, it wouldn't have left me when I came home in reverse culture shock, missing the temples in Japan. <laughs> and that being able to just walk in for um, a minute to pray, just to clear my mind. This is Onomichi. It's, it's kind of a cross between Vancouver and Tuscany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very nice. <laughs> it's about 50 minutes outside of Hiroshima. So we commuted from there to Hiroshima. And you can see the water and why I'm saying it's like Vancouver. And then the hills made it like Tuscany because up in the hills, the paths were so tiny, you couldn't fit a car. And that's where the temple walk was. There was 25 temples. And Noriko and I agreed that she didn't have to worry about me getting lost because the geography is so obvious. So we each took our camera and we, we for a couple of days, we, we just went shooting. Sometimes we'd run into each other, but basically we went on our own. So these are these are some of the images that I took in Onomichi. This this very kind gentleman, he so wanted to tell me about his little museum that with the language gap wasn't possible. These are prayers and wishes that, that are written on sticks. Cemetery. Stephen and Noriko were teasing me that I was always wanting to take photos in the cemetery. But that's why. There's some amazing things in the cemetery. And that photo I originally took because of the light. And Noriko later told me that you see those buckets and they have writing on them. Each family has their own bucket. So when they go to clean the grave, they use their bucket and their broom. The last morning I was taking this photo and then I heard chanting behind me and it sounded like Tibetan Buddhist chanting. I turned around and there were the Sugendo monks who I mentioned to you earlier, who believed by going into nature they'll find enlightenment. And they were doing some kind of ceremony. I was the only tourist. There were no Japanese tourists, no white tourists. I was the only tourist. It was all families and the monks. So I just quietly was listening, not wanting to get kicked out. And I, I, was, I stood back for a while, back kind of near those steps. And, and eventually someone came up to me and handed me a candy. and. He and this other woman sort of gestured that I could move closer if I wanted to, which I eventually did. And in my little tiny bit of Japanese, I managed to ask the man to write down what the ceremony was so that I could show it to Noriko. And she translated it for me as um, Saitu is the name of the temple, and Goma Matsuri is a, is a kind of a festival. And it turned out it was a festival for. Um, three, five, nine, three, five, seven, which is three-year-olds 
five-year-olds and seven-year-olds celebrating their coming of age. When I was rehearsing for the talk, a friend of mine pointed out, well, we wouldn't do that in the West. Kids are either spoiled or ignored in popular Western culture. And so it's such a different, again, it's a different way of creating cohesion, creating, again, queer culture that I just can't say enough about, obviously. At the beginning of the, of the, whatever the ritual was, and I, here I'm trying to figure out what is the occasion. I had no idea what it was until later. They did these kind of ritual um, motions with, with different weapons, swords and different weapons. So this was with a bow and arrow. And I was still standing farther back. And he, you know, he took the, the bow and gestured quite powerfully with it. And then he took an arrow and he strung the arrow and he went like that. And then he shot the arrow in the air. He did that four times in each of the four directions. And the fourth time, the arrow landed right next to me. And I'm like, OK, I'm not moving. I don't know what this means. And a, and a grandmother came running up. And she looked so determined. There was no way I was going to move. She took the arrow, and she gave it to one of her grandchildren. So that told me that it was some kind of good luck. They, they lit this pyre, continuing to play music. And then you can see, it's a little hard to see, but they're throwing the prayers into the fire. And I'd actually seen kids writing prayers on the sticks, and their parents were teaching them how to do the characters. We were very lucky to reach Kyoto at the peak of fall colors. If we'd been there a few days later, the leaves falling off. And I found the energy in the temples to be so, in these big temples, to be, in their Buddhist temples, to be, well, no, sorry, excuse me, Buddhist and Shinto. The, the energy, it's like it has a texture to it, a depth. I loved it. I've never experienced anything like it. And it's probably the part of the trip I've been looking for from when I was the youngest. So the beauty of the temples comes at a cost. I saw older women, and they seemed to be working themselves to the bone, like just frantically cleaning. So I asked Noriko to take this picture. And also, I asked her to take this one. <laughs> this is the broom that, that's the kind of broom that they use when they're cleaning. Another way to pray. So in conclusion, I'm going to um, share a couple of poems of Takashi Nagai. They're very short. And then one little story from Tokyo about the spirit of Japan. Nuclear war is not at all beautiful or interesting. It is the most disappointing most brutal and most complete form of destruction. Only ashes and bones remain. Nothing touches the heart. Nuclear war ended in Nagasaki. Nagasaki is the period. Peace starts from Nagasaki.
Bert and Isako took me to Meiji Jingu. It's a, it's a major shrine in the heart of Tokyo. And there's a huge park, something like Stanley Park, and you walk like 20 minutes to get to the shrine. And when we entered, I saw this woman with intention bowing. And when we got to the shrine, I saw her again. And when we left, I saw her. I saw her five or six times. It just seemed that our paths kept intersecting. And to me, she embodies the spirit of Japan with her intention and her grace. I never saw her face, even though I kept seeing her. And my intuition was she probably comes every day. And she paused at the gate and bowed, and she would go through, and then she would pause on the other side with each gate. So that's our pilgrimage to Japan. Thank you very much. Um, I I was born uh, seven years after the uh, um, bombing. Yeah, I uh, not no, yes bombing. So and then when I was like uh, uh, primary school, when we go to the school, mm -hmm. we when it's rain, we have to always wear the umbrella. Mm -hmm. You see, never without the umbrella. You know, even though so many years after. Yeah. So that's our scar yeah. in my deep inside. And uh, this is really surface. Mm. Today I, I saw. And uh, like uh, um, Hiroshima River. Mm. You saw the river, right? Yeah. Beside the dome. Yeah. People are so hot. So they jumped. Yeah. That actually, one of the uh, actors' uh, mother very famous actor's mother, was living in uh, Hiroshima at that time. And uh, he, she has to go to the work, mm -hmm. to Hiroshima, mm -hmm. at that day. She was out, uh, living a little bit outside of Hiroshima city, but she has to go to work. Anyway, so she went to the work in the morning. Yeah. And somehow her uh, shoes, uh, shoes, shoe uh, she has to do it. Mm. So she went down. Yeah. At that same time, bomb came up. Mm. So she was in front of the building. Mm. So she stayed. Wow, mm. that's incredible. Yeah. So that's those incredible. kind of small, small little stories. Yeah, they're so important. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we, ha I think I, we have to share those stories. <laughs> Thank you for sharing them. Yeah. Before the talk, I got a rather odd email from someone that said, I took it as a bit hostile. And they said, if you would go to Pearl Harbor and talk to survivors, I would come to your talk. Mm -hmm. And so I really contemplated that. And I thought, well, why am I going to Japan? And you know one reason, or you know a lot of reasons already from what I've said. But I think there's something about the culture that caused it going to visit, right? Like, I could go to Japan, Japanese could go to China. I mean, we have to build bridges. Mm -hmm. And it's not about revenge or who is right or wrong, right? So. <coughs> it's impactful for me as a teenager to be at the Gamakudong on a school trip, dressed in school uniform with my blonde hair with all my classmates and, and they were Japanese and they were all Japanese <laughs> and walking through it thinking what's this going to be like am I the perpetrator am I because their their grandparents were still affected but it was close still close to them. They, they had stories that they were sharing and we were folding our paper cranes on the Shinkansen all the way down and I was folding too uh, it was for a 16 year old it was so it, it, it hung in my, my, my soul. Um, and I married a Japanese man, as you know. My kids carry this, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm German, so I have mm -hmm. genocide 
and Nazis on the other side. So um, it's, it's, I, I bring this multicultural now to the now. <laughs> and it is, it, the, when I do my own shamanic or healing work, this, the, just the tremendous distortions in family lines and pain that is not that far back, just two generations or three generations, and the impact on my parents when their parents were unavailable from their book, their, their, their pain. Yeah. And I see my kids being raised in this conflict-free, abundant world, or at least to their, their little myopic vision, right? And we went to the photography um, exhibit at UBC last year, and I took my kids. They didn't want to go, kicking and screaming, you know, teenagers, <laughs> this is stupid. And it landed, just when they saw the dress, uh, the pictures of everyday artifacts. Um, it was the everyday things, and they landed. And so I thank you for sharing today, because it's just brought me a lot of uh, deeper hope I would just say and second what you're saying is that it's so incredibly important to do this work because it affects everybody mm -hmm. on the planet. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't understand how you're connected to these events, everybody on the planet, parents or grandparents lived through the war and they were on some side of that war and the way that it impacted on them especially if they couldn't speak about it or they didn't speak about it it then becomes it goes deeper into the next generation and as it goes along and along the intergenerational trauma of these events makes it harder and harder to unearth them so even though it seems like very heavy work to do I know you <laughs> work as well, mm -hmm. but it's incredibly freeing to do this work. Mm -hmm. I know um, from doing this work myself and researching how it's affected all the different branches of my family that I'm freeing my children. This kind of thing and the consolation work is obviously so important and also art is so important, I think. And Olivia knows that too, and, and Yukiko, and you know, you go yeah. with this gallery, yeah. to have art and music and beauty to heal mm -hmm. things like these anniversaries, yeah. um, to have those types of events um, as part of remembering, I think are uh, incredibly important and can work on a deep level in a kind of mysterious way <laughs> for large groups of people. Thank you. Uh, what do we all have to keep learning from this? And this presentation tonight was so amazingly powerful because I didn't realize how much the Japanese have been evolving and developing into some sense of forgiveness and, and understanding. And to receive you the way you were received and everybody learning from that and moving into forgiveness and what do we do next has been incredibly powerful. I am so thrilled that it's come to this, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just want to say that the Second World War um, affected me in two ways. One way in that my family on my father's side was in Vancouver um, when it happened. So they got sent off to the internment camp. My grandfather came in 1918 as a World War I draft dodger. He, to escape the First World War, he would have been constricted into the Japanese army. So he escaped mm -hmm. that being a devout Buddhist, came to Vancouver, and then World War II happens. On my mother's side, she was playing outside with the best friend, just outside of Hiroshima, when the bomb went off. And she, her little village was separated by a mountain, so all she saw was a big, she remembers seeing a flash, a huge bang like thunder, and then rain falling, like charcoal ink. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> saying the person she was playing with was her childhood friend, and they were lifelong friends. 
right up until my mother passed away about four years ago. But I never really asked her about that day, probably until about six years ago. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and when my mother and I went to Japan in 94, her uncle was walking across a bridge two kilometers away from the blast. And he was thrown. And the entire left or right side of his body was burned. And it was a single straight line right down the middle. Where one side was unburned, perfect. The other side was burned. And they put cucumbers and aloe, raw aloe on it. And he, apparently he healed with a scar. And I had about maybe a three or four hour talk with him about what he saw, the horrific scenes that he saw and what he had to go through and walk through. And I didn't see him. He passed away the following year in 95, just watching TV. Mm -hmm. But he, nothing, no, no ill effects or no diseases or anything. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everyone for sharing, for participating, for supporting me by coming. It means a lot to have you here. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.